good today. You are looking good today. Wow, a lot of awesome people in this house today and every week, and I'm so excited to be here. But let me tell you what happened to me this week. I was preparing this message literally the entire week. When I start preparing, I start like on Monday, and I go clear up until Saturday. So Friday night, 3 o'clock in the morning, Kate had come into our room, and then after she had left the room, God really impressed upon me that I needed to get rid of the entire message for the whole week and start over on Saturday. So all day Saturday, I wrote this message, but I believe that there's a purpose behind it, and I believe there was a reason that he stopped me in my tracks. And how many of you know when God tells you to do something, you just do it, amen? You just do it. So I think, you know, God having a different plan is okay a lot of times, and I'm always open to what he wants to do in my life. And I look around at our church, and I think with a church this large, we've got so many different things happening and so many different spiritual, we've got spiritual diversity here, right? Some of you are brand new to the faith. You have just come to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I am thrilled that you are here in the house today. And many of you are seasoned with God. Maybe you have been a believer for 30 years. Maybe it's 20, 10, I don't know, maybe five years ago. And you're a little bit more seasoned in your faith. And again, I am thrilled that you're here today in this house. So what I believe is that God prompted me to give this message for all of us in all of our seasons of faith because as we approach Christmas, we need to be reminded of why we do what we do, what we do it for, and to keep our thoughts fresh and alive and our foundation strong. Because if it weren't for Christmas and the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we wouldn't be doing church. Amen? We would not be doing church. So I'm going to ask you today to do something for me. I'm going to ask you to really have open ears and an open mind. I think it's very important as we come into the house that we expect God to reveal something to us, right? So we always want to come in here expecting. We don't ever want to come into the house thinking that it's a mundane thing that we do that it's routine, that it's just something that we happen to be doing this particular day. In fact, today should be more exciting than it was last week, and I'm hoping that next week will even be more exciting than it is today, right? I want to remind you of this, that sometimes as believe, believers, whether we are new or seasoned in our faith, we many times bury some things beneath the surface in our Christian walk. So in today's talk, I'm going to give you a direct reminder that I truly believe that God has oppressed upon my heart to give to you, a direct reminder of what our purpose is as a Jesus follower, why God has chosen us, why he has called us into this house, into this house. There are many houses, but we've been called into this house and what God expects, expects of us while we are here. I think it's important to know what he wants, right? I think it's important for us to know that. And if you need a title for this message, oddly enough, it's really funny when Tim got up here and he said this phrase, this is the title for the message. It's called, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. So we have this place, we have this home that we affectionately refer to as the experience first, where Jesus, I'm sorry, did I say first? The experience church, where Jesus is first and we are second. Let's try that again. Where Jesus is first and we are second. Where our hearts are strengthened, where hope is found, and a home that we call the perfect place for imperfect people. There couldn't be a better home for me, you guys. There couldn't be a better home. Now, if I ask you this question, think in your mind, if I say, what to you is the perfect home? I know there's a depiction in your mind of what that would look like. Maybe it's warmth and it's a safe place. It's a place where you can kick your shoes off after a long day, a place where love exists, a home where you're accepted and you're valued and you're appreciated. 
And as many of you know, we have our own home that has three daughters. And as they were growing up in our home, Tim and I would always imagine that day when they wouldn't be there anymore. When they would be moved, when they would move out. Now that's not terrible, you guys. What we do as parents is we raise our tr- children to leave, right? And right now we have one. She's married. She's not there. She's got her own home with her husband Nate, and we still have two at home. But the the most important thing for me, not was not them leaving, but was this. When Tim and I would talk about it, I wanted a place where they would want to come back to. I would want a place where they could come and visit, a place where they could be accepted and loved and appreciated and valued. And for many of you that are here today, I know that I know that I know that you did not grow up in a home like that. I would venture to say that many of you that had a home that you grew up in that was not that great, you don't really want to go back and visit. They're not good memories there for you. Maybe your home looked dark and abusive. And maybe your home, you had a lot of financial struggles or your parents didn't get along. Maybe they divorced. Maybe you grew up in a home where there was alcoholism or drug abuse and it was just really, really tough and there were a lot of struggles. And if that is you today and that's what you experienced, I want you to know this is not that place. I want you to know that in this house, this home, it's a place where you are welcomed and you are loved and you are not judged. You will experience God's forgiveness. You'll experience his strength. You'll find biblical, solid relationships. We encourage that. And you will find a place where you can grow spiritually. And I love, I love that you're here today. Don't ever miss that. We are glad that you're in our house. We're glad that you're in the house of God. And I'm gonna ask you, if you open your heart, you really open it up today and you really listen close, I truly believe that God's gonna speak something to you that will transform your life. He wants to strengthen you in your walk with Jesus. We don't do this randomly, we come in here to be transformed in our lives. So as I get ready, for the scripture today. I wanna set up the scene for you. I wanna tell you exactly where we are in this story and where Jesus is. And all we know is this, Jesus had a knack for upsetting the apple cart. He had a knack for doing things that other people would not do. And one particular day, we find the Pharisees and they're talking and complaining in front of Jesus. Now the Pharisees, they were the religious people of the day. They were very judgmental and they were very opinionated and they had an opinion about Jesus. And he, they were complaining about him hanging out with sinners and eating dinner with them. And they were tax collectors. And in fact, the, the Pharisees called them notorious sinners. Now I started to think about it and I thought, why would they be notorious? I would venture to say that these were people who were sinning openly. Maybe it was someone who was caught in adultery. Maybe it was someone who was a prostitute or someone who had alcohol problems. And so although Jesus wasn't really concerned about what the Pharisees thought, he still took time to explain why he did what he did. Because let's get this, deep down, he wanted those Pharisees to understand the truth. He wanted them to know, just like everyone else in the day. So he began this parable, this story that would make sense to the Pharisees and also to anyone else who would listen. listen. And you see, with the Pharisees there, I think they got a taste of exactly what it is he wanted to implore upon them that day. So let's go ahead and get started. Are you ready? You ready? Are you ready? Okay, follow along with me. Parable of the lost son in Luke 15. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his two sons. A few days later, this younger son packed up all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. About that time, his money ran out and a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that he, even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. And he finally came to his senses, and he said to himself, at home, everybody say with me, at home, at home. At home, 
Even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming in the distance. And filled with love and compassion, the father ran to the son and embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he was found. So the party began. I think that might be one of my favorite lines. So the party began. We love to party in the in T.E. house, right? So meanwhile, meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, everyone say home. He heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry. He was jealous and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All of these years I have slaved for you and it never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all of that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours, notice he doesn't say my brother, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now he is found. Yes, you can clap for that. So all of that, that whole story to land on three things that I want to look at today. And there are three people in this story that we are going to look at. There is the son who strayed. There is the son who stayed. And there's the father who prayed. And we're going to start out with the son who strayed. And what I want you to, de to do today is to kind of see if you identify with any of these three people as we go through the rest of our talk together. So the son who strayed represents in this parable people who are far from God or people who have strayed away from God. You see, in the story, he, the younger son, asks his father for the inheritance. He asks him for his share of money, which they did not do in that day. And the father willingly gives it to him, and he leaves to travel all over creation. He's looking for something better than what he thought he had and what his father had given him. He went to another town, he hung out with the partiers, and began to quickly see that his lifestyle was leading to disappointment and dissatisfaction. You see, he was far away from home. You know, for me, I grew up in the church. I was a young girl in the church, and I went to vacation Bible school, and I was in the youth group. I was baptized in my church, did all the things that a church girl does, and then I went to college. Anybody? Then I went to college. It was in college where I strayed and I walked away from everything that I knew about God. I spent a ton of days and months and years with people I should have never been around. And I knew better. I knew what God had taught me. I knew what it was like in my home. But I walked away from that and it really wasn't until I hit rock bottom rock solid bottom that I began to repent and turn my life around. I don't know if any of you can relate to that. You know, I'd left what I knew was right into a lifestyle that I knew was wrong. And I was at rock bottom and that's where we find the younger brother in this story. You know, it says he was in the pigsty eating pig food. How, pig food, how low can you get? How low can you go? So this is a picture that illustrates someone who is far from God, far from Jesus. Maybe it's a Jesus follower who has walked away 
from the obedience of God into rebellion. It shows what sin really does to us and what it does in someone's life when they begin to reject God. And come on, somebody agree with me here when I say this. Sin will promise more than it will give. It will take you further than you want to go, and it will leave you worse off than you were before. Amen? It will leave you worse off. You see, sin promises freedom, but it actually brings slavery. It confines you. It binds you up. So at a certain moment, the son who strayed, it says, came to his senses, and he made the decision to go back home to his father and ask for forgiveness. You see, he was willing to give up every bit of his rights as a son and become a servant. He didn't have anything to offer except for his service, but he was ready to repent. He was ready to turn away from the lifestyle that he had led and fall at his father's feet and ask for forgiveness and mercy. Do you know why? Because he knew there was no place like home. I know for many of you here today, you've experienced the same thing. You've gone out into the world looking for better things. I've been there. Maybe you can relate to the son who has strayed, or maybe you're struggling right now that you've walked away from God for a certain period of time and you want to come back into his arms. You've drifted a little. You've walked away from him enough that you know that you're not in the right place. You're floundering just a bit. In fact, you might even be coming to church and you're sitting in a seat and you're staying undetected, unnoticed, and unassuming. But God knows. God still knows what's going on in your life. And maybe if that's where you are right here, right now in this place, and you really want to turn away from that lifestyle that you're living, but you're wondering this, will God really forgive me? Will he forgive me? And I'm going to add another layer onto that. Not only will God forgive me, but will the church accept me? Will the church accept me? But I want you to know this today, that this church gets its cue from God and God alone. And the word says this, God will draw you up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set your feet on a rock, making your steps secure. He will redeem your life from the pit who will crown you with steadfast love and mercy. And we the church will be here to help you as you stay the course. You see, it is not our job as the church to point fingers at you and tell you everything that you're doing wrong. It is our job as the church to point you to, you to God and encourage you to do what he says is right. What he says is right. It is not our job to tell you that because I'll guarantee everyone in this place already knows what they've done wrong. Shoot, I knew what I did wrong this morning. I probably already know what I'm going to do wrong tomorrow, right? Let's be honest. We know. We don't need fingers pointed at us telling. All we need to do as a church is point people to God. He will set people in the right place, amen? He'll set them there, amen? So the second person in our story, the son who stayed. The son who stayed represents the self-righteous, the Pharisees of the day, and maybe even some of us who are in this house at this moment. The son who stayed, as we remember in our story, felt entitled to something. So the son who stayed is entitled. It's the person who has paid his or her dues, who might stand a bit judgmental, kind of standing back and peering forward and looking toward the brother, just like the Pharisees did toward the sinners. Very judgmental, very opinionated about what's going on with other people and not looking at their own lives. And we can't deny in the story that the son, he worked hard. He obeyed his father. He bought, brought no disgrace to the family. He was a great son. Why? Because he knew there was no place like home. He knew that. 
But part of his job as the oldest son was this, to help reconcile the father to the younger son. Are you getting the story yet? He's there to help reconcile that. He should have been the host of the party, not the criticizer. And those of us that are in the house today, part of our job is to reconcile people back to God, the ones that don't know him. It's our job as seasoned believers, the ones who have stayed. But the son who stayed, he was supposed to be the mature one. And as we find in our story, he really wasn't. He was supposed to be the one who helped, the one who was there with open arms welcoming his brother home. And if we're not careful, church, if we're not careful, we can easily become like that. We can get used to things going a certain way, right? Get used to the routine. We can forget everything that we do is for the person who walks through that door who doesn't know Jesus. It's everything that we do. Everything that we do. If we're not careful, we can feel a little bit entitled. Maybe we start to feel this. The church really isn't doing enough for me. I have a special seat. I'm a, I have a special role. I'm not as welcoming to those who are out of the fold as I used to be. I'm a little bit entitled to what I am at this moment. And I'm going to ask you this question. I'll ask you, let's just close your eyes for a minute. Let's just close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. I want you to think back for just a minute. And I want you to remember the very first time you walked into the doors of TE Church. Because if you're that person today, I want you to remember this one thing. I want you to remember what happened that day. I want you to remember the love and the warmth and the acceptance of a God who extended his grace and mercy to you. I want you to remember the people who shook your hand and opened the doors and welcomed you with grace and love and mercy. And I want you to open your eyes. And now, I want you to remember that we're supposed to do the same. We're supposed to do the same. So the son who stayed might look like many of us, but what I believe that for 2017, it's going to change who we are, and we're not going to look the same as what we were. We're going to allow this word to transform us, and we're going to end up extending grace and love and mercy and acceptance to people who are coming in that door. But I want to remember this. We can be full of love and grace and mercy and everything's beautiful and butterflies are flying and hearts are showing. But what we have to remember this is what I said in the beginning is that we point people to God and God will show them the right way. Sin is sin. Sin is real. We can't be fluffy all the time on the pillows of clouds. We have to understand that why we do what we do is because of the sin and why God is giving the grace is for the thing that we did wrong, right? So there is such thing as sin. God will show you what that is though. So remember that. All right, the last person in the story, the father who prayed. The father who prayed. The father who prayed represents our big God. And the thing about our big God is this. He gives us this thing called free will. So he lets us go on our own way. In fact, after this service today, tonight, I don't know, you might just go out and party with the crazies. I don't know what you're going to do. But you're, God gives you free will to do that. He gives us free will to make our decisions. And that day, the father, when the son came and said, give me everything that is yours, that is mine, the father said, sure, here it is. He willfully gave it to his son because he was a forgiving God and he was constant. God, our father, not only loves the son who strays, he also loves the loves the son who stays. So what I want us to be careful of in this house is that we get so concerned and worried about the person coming in, it's not about me anymore. All they're worried about is the empty seat and people here. No. God loves you, loves me, loves the person who doesn't know Jesus exactly the same. At the foot of the cross, we are all equal. So we never have to worry about not having our rightful place in God's eyes. Amen? We don't have to worry about that. God watches over us. He's waiting for us to come to him. He's waiting for every one of us to run to him because when he sees us in the distance, 
and he's watching for us, and he sees us coming toward him. He reaches his hand out, and we grab a hold of each other, and he begins to sustain us and strengthen us and remind us of whose we are. You see, it's the Father's goodness that brought the prodigal son that home today. It wasn't the lashing. It wasn't the conviction. It wasn't the things that people would do to other people. It was his love and goodness. He's a forgiving God. He is loving. He's accepting. He gave grace to a son who did not deserve it. All God wants for every one that he has created is to come home, to fall in his arms, to ask for forgiveness, to receive his love and to model his son, Jesus. And please be reminded of this today. It is both how God sees those far from him and how God sees those close to him. He sees both the same. And it's how all of us who are followers of Jesus should see and love and accept those who are far from him. Listen, it's our job. It's what we're here for. I really believe with 2017 coming, we have some exciting things happening, but I believe as a church body, man, we gotta be ready for people who don't know Jesus. And I believe that the thing that I know about our church is that we're full of change and we're full of compassion for people. And I look at and I look at all of your eyes and I think, you know what? At one point you were at that place. I was at that place at the feet of Jesus saying, please save me. Let's have the hearts of compassion to do the same for others. I wanna pray as we go out of this place today. Go ahead and close your eyes. You know, we have two sons that were in the house that day. The son who strayed. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're far from God and you've walked away or you're in a situation this right very minute that you're doing something that you know is not what God wants you to do. In fact, let's just say it, it's wrong. It's wrong. And you're ready to turn the other way and you wanna make it right with God. Maybe you don't even know Jesus today, but what I want you to know is this, there is hope. There is hope. Or maybe you're the son that stayed and you're fighting a judgmental spirit today. If we can just be honest with God, if that's you, maybe you've lost your patience with those who you need the most that God has entrusted with you. Maybe you've you've been walking with God so long you feel a little bit entitled, a little bit looking down at your nose at those who are not where you are. You're holding on to position and your seat. I want to ask you today, if that's if either of those is you and you find yourself in that place, I want you just to take a minute and raise your hand. All eyes closed, please. If that's you today, just raise your hand. We're going to pray with you. Yeah, we see your hand still going up. Yep, yep. Strayed or stayed, yep. Let's just pray together. God, I just pray for everyone who's raised their hand today, Father. You know what's going on in their hearts, God, and we are promised by you that you will help us and give us hope in our times of trouble, God. So I pray right now over every person who has their hand raised, God, that you will give them hope and the assurance to know that you are there to help them transform out of this way of thinking, God. Pray for those who have strayed, God, that they'll come back to you and feel stronger than ever, God. And those who are have stayed and that feel a little judgmental with a critical spirit, God, that you would soften their hearts and remind them of whose they are. And just keep your eyes closed for just one minute. And our third person in the story today was the father who prayed. And I know for many of you, many of you right now, you're praying for something that you've just not seen an answer yet to. Maybe you're praying for your marriage. Maybe you're praying for a child or a relationship or a best friend who's no longer your friend anymore, whatever that is, if you're praying for something today and you've not seen an answer for it, just raise your hand. Wow, yeah. Just keep your hands up, yeah. We're gonna pray with you today. We're gonna believe with you, God. We know that we walk by faith, not by sight. And every prayer you hear and you bottle up, God, And you're working on things behind the scenes that we don't even know about, Father. So I pray right now, Father, that you would give assurance to these people who have their hands raised that you're working behind the scenes when nobody else can. God, remind them that they just continue to pray and persevere and be consistent, God, in seeking you and not being anxious about the outcome, but know that, God, you have a plan and a purpose for this walk that they're on and this prayer that they've given to you, God. And you can put your hands down. Maybe you're that person today who 
has, is not in a relationship with Jesus and you're here today and you're thinking, I want to know him and I want to be a Jesus follower and I want to give you an opportunity right now to make that next step. We're talking about things today that of hope and love and grace and assurance and it's available for you. So if you today want to have that relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want to give you this moment just to go ahead and raise your hand and we are going to pray with you. Yeah, we see you. Go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, we see you. Yeah, we see you. Yeah. Just pray along with me in your hearts. God, I know I'm a sinner, but I know that your grace covers every one of my sins, Father. And I believe that you gave Jesus, your son, to die on a cross and to rise again and he's sitting at the right hand with you to cover every sin that I have, God. And I know right now that you see me white as snow, Father. And I'm thankful to be in a place that I can walk alongside other believers and begin to learn and grow and share, God, and begin to uh, just get stronger in my faith, God. So, Father, we just thank you right now for everyone who raised their hand. It was now, we know the angels are celebrating big. And God, we just want to pray for everyone in this house, Father, that as we get into the Christmas season, that you remind us of who we are, that we are to love and encourage and to grow, Father. And we pray for this, uh, the Christmas Eve services that are coming up, God, that you would multiply the hearts of people who come. We love you. We praise you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone in the house said, Amen. Amen.